All right, good morning. So um, last time we started seeing how we can solve LP problems that have only two decision variables. Um, and last time we saw two examples. There was one maximization problem and the other minimization problem. So now we're going to continue our discussion um, just to sort of get an idea of what kind of LP problems uh, exist and what do their solutions look like in some sense. So this is example number three. And suppose that we have the following problem. So I would like to maximize minus x1 plus 2x2. And my constraints are as follows. So x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 6. And minus x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 8. And x1 and x2 are non-negative. So last time, as I said, we looked at two examples. The first example was a maximization problem. The second one was a minimization problem. And if you recall, both problems actually had sort of unique optimal solutions. So there was a single, uh, single best uh, feasible solution in some sense. Um, so today we're going to continue. This is another maximization problem. So let's try to, again, draw the feasible region of this problem. So since we have only two variables, we only need two axes, x1 and x2. So let me start with the first constraint. So what's the region defined by the first constraint? Well, let's recall the procedure. So whenever you have an inequality constraint, you first turn it into equality constraint. OK, so we first uh, figure out the line corresponding to x1 plus x2 equals 6. And it's not too hard to see that that's a line that goes through 0, 6, and 6, 0. So this is the line given by x1 plus x2 equals 6. OK. And then if you recall from last time, we said that whenever we have an inequality, it's actually dividing the space into two half spaces, right? So basically, um, you know, think of the x1, x2 plane as our full space. So this line actually divides into two. And whenever we have an inequality constraint, we have to pick one of, one of the two sides, basically, right? So, and the sort of the next question is, which side should I pick? Well, as I said, I mean, the easiest procedure is as follows. Just pick any point which is not on this line. So for example, I can pick 0, 0, for instance, OK? And plugging 0, 0 into this <coughs> inequality, is the inequality satisfied by the origin? So does 0, 0 satisfy this inequality? Yes, it does. So as a result, this is the correct side. So this is a region corresponding to the first constraint. So this is the half space uh, defined by the first constraint, right? So now let me look at the second one. So minus x1 plus 2x2 equals 8. So again, first of all, I'm going to look at the boundary. So I'm going to turn it into equality constraint. So if x1 is 0, x2 should be equal to 4, which is somewhere over here. And if x2 is 0, x1 should be minus 8, right, exactly, which is somewhere over here. So it goes through these two points. So this is my line corresponding to minus x1 plus 2x2 equals 8. So once again, this is the boundary of our region. Okay. Um, so this line also divides my uh, plane into two half spaces. The next question is, which side should I pick? Well, once again, pick any point which is not on this line. So again, you can pick 0, 0, for instance, because that's easy to compute. Does 0, 0 satisfy the second inequality? Yes, it does. So as a result, 0, 0 is on the right side. So the region defined by the second constraint is basically everything on or below the second line, basically, right? OK. What else do we have? Well, x1 is non-negative. What does that mean? So everything should be on the right side, basically, of the x1 axis. Uh, sorry, x2 axis, rather. And then we have x2 non-negative, so everything should be on or above the x1 axis. So as a result, each of these four constraints divides my plane into, into two half planes. And the set of feasible regions is given by the set of points that satisfy all of them at the same time, right? OK. So what's the corresponding feasible region in this problem? Well, I mean, if you just think about this a little bit, so basically I should be on this side of this line, I should be on this side of this line, I should be on this side of this line, and I should be on this side of this line, right? So as a result, basically, the feasible regions, everything in this area. OK? So now our goal is the following. So uh, the feasible region tells me the possible values x1, x2 can take for this problem. 
So what I'm interested in is, among all possible values x1 and x2 and x can take, what's the best value of x1 and x2? So how do we measure the best value? Again, we, we, we now use the objective function, right? So once again, one thing that you should remember is the following. So when you draw the feasible region, the objective function does not come into the picture at all. Okay, so the objective function actually has nothing to do with the feasible region, with the definition of the feasible region, okay? It comes into the picture when you start sort of ranking your feasible solutions, okay? Which, which feasible solution is better for me? So that's when the objective function in some sense comes into the picture. So our next goal is basically to figure out the, the optimal solution, okay? So how do we do that? Well, this is a maximization problem, right? So we should first of all figure out what the isoprofit lines look like, okay? So how do we do that? Well, what you can do is the following. So we can look at the equation, for example, minus x1 plus 2x2 equals 0. So this is my objective function value. So which values of x1 and x2 will give me an objective function value of 0, basically, right? So what does that line look like? Well, obviously, it goes through the origin, right? So that's one point. I need one more point, basically. So if x1 is, for example, if x1 is equal to 2, um, x2 should be equal to 1, right? So basically, it goes through this one and this one, I guess. Okay. So it actually goes through these two points. So this is my isoprofit line. This is the line corresponding to minus x1 plus 2x2 equals 0. So basically, since this line intersects my feasible region, I can achieve a profit of zero, right? So all the points that lie on the intersection of the feasible region with this blue line actually will give me a profit of zero, right? Or will give me an ob objective function value of zero. So what's the next step? Well, I need to figure out the improving direction. What's the improving direction for this problem? Well, I need to figure out the c vector. So remember, the c vector is given by the coefficients of the first decision variable and the second decision variable. So the c vector will be minus 1 and 2, basically, right? So what does the c vector look like? Well, so I have minus 1 here, and I have 2 here. So this is what my c vector looks like. So since this is a maximization problem, what's the improving direction? So the improved direction is c itself, basically, right? So since it's a maximization problem, essentially the c vector tells me the direction in which I need to move my isoprofit line to increase my, my profit. So what's the best I can do? Well, I should start with this blue line, and I should start pushing this in this direction, keeping it parallel to the first line. And if I do that, what's the best I can do? Well, the best I can do is exactly this constraint right here, basically, right? Exactly this line. So as a result, the best I can do is when this isoprofit line coincides with the boundary of this constraint. It's not too hard to see that the slope of the constraint and the slope of the isoprofit line are the same, basically, right? Okay? So as a result, the best I can do is uh, push this until it actually coincides with the boundary of this constraint, in which case, basically, all the solutions right here will be optimal, right? We'll have the largest value. And if I keep moving this direction, uh, sorry, if I keep moving this line any further, then I'm going to lose contact with the feasible region, so w which means that anything above this cannot be achieved, right, by any feasible solution. Does everyone see that? All right. So now, unlike the previous two examples, so here we have a lot of optimal solutions, basically, right? So um, in the first two examples that we have seen, uh, there were only, well, in both of them, there was a single best solution, right? Whereas right here, for example, how many optimal solutions are there in this case? There are actually infinitely many optimal solutions, right? Why is that? Because essentially, for example, you know, this corner point here is an optimal solution. This corner point here is also an optimal solution. And anything in between is also an optimal solution, right? So how many points are there in between? Well, there are infinitely many points, basically, okay? So as a result, uh, this is an example where we have more than one solution. So let me call this point A, and let me call this point B. So for this problem, every feasible solution, every feasible solution on the line segment AB on the line segment AB 
is an optimal solution. with the same objective function value. And let's just verify that this is true. So for example, let me look at A first. So at point A, what's the value of x1? x1 is 0. What about x2? x2 will be equal to 4, right? So basically a corresponds to the point 0, 4. And what's the objective function value at this point? In other words, what's the quality of this solution with respect to my objective function? So I'm going to have minus x1, so I'm going to have minus 0, plus 2 times x2, 2 times 4. And I'm going to have a value of 8, basically, right? Okay. Let's verify the objective function value at B. So what's the value of x1 at B? Well, you just need to figure out the intersection point, right? The intersection of those two lines. Um, what's the value of x1? I think x2 will be equal to 14 over 3, right? So x2 is 14 over 3. And if x2 is 14 over 3, x1 will be equal to 4 over 3, I guess, right? So you just solve the two equations simultaneously, right? So what's the objective function value at this point? Well, I'm going to have minus x1, so minus 4 over 3, plus 2 times 14 over 3. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is still 8, right? So, and that should be surprising, basically, right? Why not? Because, well, both of the points A and B actually lie on this line already, okay? They should, they should always satisfy this equation, okay? Um, and also, if you pick any point in between, it's not too hard to see that you'll also get a value of 8, okay? So as a result, in this case, there's more than one optimal solution. Um, so the optimal value is equal to is given by 8. And the optimal value is achieved by by infinitely many feasible solutions. So does everyone see why there are infinitely many optimal solutions in this problem? As I said, I mean, A is optimal, B is all optimal, but anything in between is also optimal, okay? So in this case, we say that the LP problem has alternate optimal solutions. Alternate, or sometimes we say multiple optimal solutions. So let's just sort of uh, quickly review what we did. So in the first two examples that we saw on, on Monday, uh, there was actually one corner point which was optimal, right? So there was a single best feasible solution. Whereas in this case, so there are actually infinitely many uh, feasible solutions that are optimal. Um, however, note that there are still some corner points which are optimal, right? So for example, A is a corner point which is optimal, and B is also a corner point which is optimal. So later on, we're going to see that even if your LP problem has, has multiple optimal solutions, there will always be a corner point which is optimal. Okay, so, and that's important. So for example, in this case, actually there are two corner point solutions that are optimal. Um, and this is not a coincidence. Okay, so later on we shall see that, that this is actually a very nice property of linear program problems. And it will allow us to develop actual generalized algorithms for this problem. Okay? Um, any questions? So let me briefly talk about what does it mean to have, have multiple optimal solutions, for instance. Well, I mean, tr think of this as a production planning problem, for instance, of some sort, okay? So x1 is the number of uh, units of the first product I'm going to produce. x2 is the number of units of second product I'm going to produce. So basically what this tells you is the following. 
So for this particular production schedule, you get a profit of 8. Okay? For this different production schedule, you still get a profit of 8. Okay? So basically, these two production schedules are indifferent in some sense. Okay? Or you're indifferent between the two production schedules. So in such situations, what you can do is you, you have a sort of freedom to choose. Okay? So you can either choose this one, if you like, or you can choose this alternative one. Okay? And both of them will give you the same, same value, essentially. Okay? So as a result, uh, from a mathematical point of view, you know, feasible solutions A and B are, are, are equivalent in some sense. Okay? They're different, but they're equivalent in terms of their objective function value. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes? That's a good question. I'm going to talk about that later on. Okay? Other questions? All right. So now this is a third type of LP problems that, that we have seen so far. So in the first two problems, we had a unique optimal solution. In this problem, we have multiple optimal solutions. What else can we have? So that's exactly what we're going to do next. So example number four. So let's consider the following problem. Maximize x1 plus 3x2. And here are my constraints. Minus x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 8. x1 is not negative and x2 is not negative. OK? So now I have only three constraints. And first of all, as usual, I'm going to start by drawing the feasible region. So what are the possible values of x1 and x2 we can take? And how can they be represented? Well, again, I'm going to start with the first inequality. OK, first I'm going to look at the equality version. And the equality version is essentially the same as that one. OK, so it's the same constraint. So it's going to go through 4 here. And it's going to go through minus 8 here. And the region defined by the first constraint is the same as the previous one. So it's going to be this region. Basically, anything on or below this line is the region defined by the first constraint. OK? Then we have non-negativity of x1, which means everything should be on or to the right of the x2 axis. And x2 is non-negative, so which means that everything should be on or above the x1 axis. So now I have three half spaces defined by each of these three constraints. So what's my feasible region? Well, again, if you think about this a little bit, so everything should be on or below this line. Everything should be on or to the right of this line, and everything should be on or above this line. And it's not too hard to see that if I take the intersection, I'm going to get this region right here, right? OK? All right, so let me figure out my isoprofit line again. Um, I'm going to look at x1 plus 3x2 equals 0. So what does that line look like? Again, it goes through the origin, right? 0, 0 is on this line. I need one more point. So for example, x1 can be, let's say, 3, right? If x1 is 3, then x2 will be minus 1, exactly. So, so it's going to go through these two points, basically, right? So this is my isoprofit line corresponding to x1 plus 3x2 equals 0. So since, again, this line intersects my feasible region at the origin, so there is a feasible solution that will give me a value of 0, basically, right? OK. Now what's the improving direction? Again, this is a maximization problem, so I need to figure out my c vector. So I'm going to look at the coefficient of x1, which is equal to 1, and coefficient of x2, which is equal to 3. So I'll have c equals 1, 3, right? So once again, I'm going to draw this vector c. So the first component is 1, and the second component is 3. So it's going to look something like this one. So this is a maximization problem. What's my improving direction? 
C itself, right? So if it were a minimization problem, then I would look at minus C, right? So, okay, so basically now I need to push this line in this direction as much as I can without leaving the feasible region, right? Okay, so what's the problem now? Well, for example, I can certainly push this line until this point, right? And I can still remain feasible. Can I do better than this? Yes. Of course I can. So, for example, I can also push it up to this point, okay? Can I do even better than this one? Yes, yes I can actually keep pushing this as much as I want, basically, right? Okay, so in other words, in my feasible region, there's nothing that prevents me from increasing my objective function as much as I want. Okay, let me repeat that again. So unlike the previous problems, there are no restrictions in my feasible region that will prevent me from increasing the objective function value. Okay, so which means that for this problem, I can actually increase my objective function value as much as I want without leaving the feasible region. Does everyone see that? So once again, in other words, I can find feasible solutions with you know, better and better objective function values. Okay, I can always make the objective function as, as large as I want. So as a result, this problem is kind of different from the previous ones in the sense that here I cannot really talk about an optimal solution, right? Because, uh, for example, if you tell me that you know, this solution right here is optimal, well, I can always find better solutions than that one. Okay? So as a result, this is a sort of uh, a strange looking problem in some sense. Um, the first observation is that the objective function function value can be increased um, by moving in the improving direction C direction C as much as you want as much as you want, while still staying in the feasible region. So this is exactly what I said earlier, so you can actually achieve arbitrarily better objective function values. Okay, so you can always actually make it better and better. All right, so in this case, So we say that the LP problem is unbounded. This should make sense because there's no bound on the objective function value in some sense, okay? So I can make the objective function value uh, increase as much as I want. So as a result, in, this, in such a case, we say that the LP problem is unbounded. So that's important. There's one uh, sort of common mistake that students tend to make. You know, in this case, the feasible region is also unbounded, basically, right? Okay. Um, but the unboundedness of the feasible region and unboundedness of the problem are not the same things. Okay. So the feasible region could be unbounded, and you can still have a, an optimal solution. Okay. If you look at example number two, that was the case. Okay. So as a result, the unboundedness of the problem actually refers to the objective function value. It does not refer to the feasible region. That's important. Okay? So as a result, when, whenever we say the problem is unbounded, that, that means that I can make the objective function value as good as I want, basically. Okay? So that's important. Basically, unboundedness of the problem always refers to the objective function, not to the feasible region. Is that clear? Okay? So that's important to keep in mind. So in such a case, as I said, there is no optimal solution. Why is there no optimal solution? Well, I just told you earlier, basically, if you tell me that a particular feasible solution is optimal, I can always find a better solution than that. Okay? So as a result, I get a contradiction, basically, right? So if you tell me that, for example, 0 0.50 is an optimal solution, I can always find, for example, 0 0.60, which is a better solution than 5.0. Okay? So as a result, there's no optimal solution. What about the optimal value? Well, the optimal value in such a case So we actually define it to be 
plus infinity. Okay, and that makes sense as well, right? So if I can increase the objective function as much as I want, then of course into limit, I can increase up to plus infinity. And similarly, if we had a minimization problem, and if I can decrease the objective function as much as I want, then I would define the optimal value to be minus infinity in that case, right? So, okay, so let me write that down. So for a minimization problem, for a minimization problem, we say that the LP problem is unbounded. is unbounded if, now just like the maximization problem, but now of course we need, we need to just reverse the argument. So instead of increasing the objective function, now we should try to decrease the objective function. If we can decrease the objective function value, decrease the objective function value as much as we want, as much as we want, while still staying in the feasible region. So in this case, the optimal value, of course, will be minus infinity. And again, this, that should make perfect sense. So if I can decrease the objective function value as much as I want, then I'm going to define it to be minus infinity, OK? The optimal value is minus infinity. Again, for a minimization problem, I cannot talk about an optimal solution, OK? There's no optimal solution either in that case, OK? And uh, as I said, I mean, intuitively, it makes perfect sense because if you tell me that there's an optimal solution, I can always find a better solution than that one, OK? So as a result, I cannot really talk about an optimal solution in such cases. Uh, and the optimal value will be defined to be either plus infinity or minus infinity, depending on whether it's a minimization or maximization problem, basically, okay? Okay, so I was just going to talk about uh, the following. So what does it mean, actually, for a problem to be unbounded, okay? So, for instance, um, suppose that, you know, you're trying to increase or maximize your profit, and, and these are the constraints you come up with, okay? And then you solve the problem, and you realize that it's an unbounded problem, okay? Now, what does that mean? Yes? So, of course, I mean, first of all, this indicates that this is not realistic, basically, right? So, you know, you shouldn't be able to do a profit of plus infinity, right? Um, so, this may indicate a number of things. For example, it may tell you that, you know, you're not considering a constraint properly, for instance, okay? Maybe there was some other constraint that you had to put in, but you forgot to add that constraint. So as a result, basically, you, you go back to your model and you say that, okay, so I forgot this constraint, I should edit and resolve my problem again, okay? Later on, we shall also see that uh, whenever an LP problem is unbounded, it gives you information about the related, another related LP problem as well, okay? So when we talk about the duality theory later on, we will see that uh, there is another LP problem which is related to this problem, and unboundness of this problem gives me information about the other problem as well. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, so essentially, if a problem is unbounded, it gives you some information. Okay, uh, from a modeling perspective, it tells you that you know your model probably is not correct. Okay, again, if in your projects, for example, if, if the problem is unbounded, then you're making a mistake basically. Okay, so go back then and, and, and fix that problem. Um, and later on, we shall also see that you know it it tells you that that uh, it gives you information about a related another. LP problem, basically, okay? So we're going to talk about that later on. So this is the third situation. So we can have a unique optimal solution. We can have multiple optimal solutions, or we can have no optimal solution, right? So no optimal solution case is this one right here. Any questions? All right. So there's one last case that I want to discuss. So example number five.
So suppose that this time we have a minimization problem. So I will minimize x1 plus 3x2 subject to x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 6 minus x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 8 x2 is greater than or equal to 6 x1 and x2 are non-negative. So now I have five constraints. So again, let's quickly draw the feasible region. I'll start with the first constraint. So first I'm going to draw the line x1 plus x2 equals 6. And since the origin satisfies that, I should pick the side in which the origin lies. So this is the region defined by the first constraint. Then I'm going to look at the second constraint. It goes through 4 and minus 8. And again, the origin, is satisfi the origin satisfies this constraint. So I'm going to put, pick everything on or below this line. Um, what about the third one? So first again I'm going to draw the line x2 equals 6. What does that line look like? So it's going to be a horizontal line that actually goes through this point right here. So this is the line corresponding to x2 equals 6. So which side should I pick? The everything on or above this line basically, right? So that's the region where x2 is at least 6. Then we have x1 non-negative, which means that everything on be to the right of x2 axis, and x2 non-negative, which means that everything should be on or above the x1 axis. So now, what's my feasible region? Well, so, I mean, let's think about this a little bit. So, so what I'm trying to do is the following. I'm trying to pick everything on or below this line. I'm going to trying to pick everything on or below this line. I'm going to try to pick everything on or to the right of this line, trying to pick everything on or above this line, and everything on or above this line as well. Well, the question is, there's no way I can satisfy all of them, right, at the same time. Okay? For example, you know, the first two constraints uh, force me to pick anything from this region, whereas the third constraint forces me to pick anything from this region, right? Okay? And these two regions have nothing in common, basically. Okay? So what does this mean? Well, this means that in this case, there's not even a feasible solution, okay? So in such a case, so there's not even a feasible solution from, from which I can make a choice, basically, okay? In other words, the constraints are inconsistent. So, you know, the constraints, th there's no value of x1, x2 that can satisfy all of the constraints at the same time. Okay? So we say that the feasible region is the empty set. So the feasible region is a set of all x1, x2 values that satisfy all of these constraints at the same time, but there's no such value. So as a result, it's just the empty set. Um, in this case, we say that the LP problem is infeasible. So if, the, if your LP problem has no feasible solutions, then we simply say that uh, the LP problem is infeasible. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, what, once again, I mean, one thing you should be careful about is that infeasibility has nothing to do with the objective function. Infeasibility is only concerned with constraints. Okay? So the feasible region is defined by the constraints, so as a result, the objective function does not play any role, basically. Okay? So whether or not a problem is infeasible is, is determined only by the constraints. Okay? Uh -huh. Exactly, that's very good. So basically, 
Essentially, whenever you have a, your problems infeasible, that means that you're putting too many constraints, okay, too many restrictions for your problem. So this is like, for instance, suppose that you want to buy a new car, okay, and then you say that, well, I don't want to pay more than 20,000 liras. I want my car to have ABS and, you know, air conditioning and this and that. I want to make sure that, you know, uh, it's not going to use too much fuel or gas or whatever. Such a car does not exist, okay? So that, that's basically what it means. So you have to somehow uh, give up some of your restrictions, basically, okay? You have to either like eliminate your budget constraint or eliminate the ABS property or, or something, okay? So essentially, whenever you're uh, in such a situation, that basically means that your constraints cannot be satisfied or uh, all of your constraints cannot be satisfied, okay? So this is, this is like saying, you know, um, I don't want to spend any money, but I want to make profits. Well, that doesn't exist, right? So that's not possible, basically, okay? So as a result, uh, this essentially means that, you know, you're putting too much constraints, too many constraints on your problem, so if you want to satisfy your constraints, then you should sort of think of dropping some of them, okay? Eliminating some of your constraints. Is that clear? So as I said, I mean, if you, if you put too many constraints, then, then no solution will satisfy those constraints, okay? So again, think of the, the car buying example. Uh, if you want to too many properties at the same time, and if you want your car to be cheap, then such a car does not exist, okay? So you have to actually make sure that you either give up on some properties or you increase your budget or do something like that. Is that clear? All right, so this basically wraps up our, our discussion of uh, different types of LP problems. So let me summarize what we have. So here's a summary. So every LP problem falls into exactly one of the four cases. And case number one, so the LP problem has a unique optimal solution. So this is the case for examples one and two. See example one and example two. Case number two, um, the LP problem has alternate or multiple optimal solutions. This is the case in example three. So in this case, there are infinitely many optimal solutions. That's important. There are infinitely many optimal solutions. Example number three, or case number three, sorry. In case three, the LP problem is unbounded. So see example four. In this case, there's no optimal solution. So that was the previous example that we have seen. And case number four is the problem is infeasible. And that's the last example. The LP problem is infeasible. In this case, obviously, there's no feasible solution. Now let me just go back to this last example again. So if there's no feasible solution, then what can I say about the optimal solution? Well, 
Remember the definition of an optimal solution? Optimal solution is the best feasible solution, basically, right? And if there's no feasible solution, well, there's no optimal solution either. So in this case, again, so therefore, again, there's no optimal solution. And actually, every LP problem falls into exactly one of these four cases. So either it has a unique optimal solution, or it may have alternate or, or multiple optimal solutions. It may have no optimal solution because the problem is unbound, or it may have no optimal solution because the problem is infeasible. Okay? Now, one thing that I'd like you to pay attention to is the following. So, how many optimal solutions are there in the first case? There's one, right? How many optimal solutions are there in the second case? Infinitely many. In the third case? Zero. In the fourth case, zero again. So this is important. The number of optimal solutions in an LP problem can be either zero or one or infinity. Okay? These are the only three possible values it can take. Okay? You can never have an LP problem with two optimal solutions. Okay? Later on we shall see why that's the case. But this is important to keep in mind. So if you look at the number of optimal solutions in an LP problem, it should be either equal to one in the case of a unique solution, or it could be equal to infinity in the case of multiple or alternate solutions or in the case of unboundedness or infeasibility it should be equal to zero okay so that's important so as I said uh, you know if I tell you to construct an LP problem with two optimal solutions you cannot do it basically such a problem doesn't exist okay so in the next next class we're going to see why that's the case uh, but essentially uh, you can either have one optimal solution or infinitely many optimal solutions, or zero optimal solution. So those are the only cases. Any questions? All right, so let's stop here and we'll continue next week, okay?